The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good morning or afternoon. This is Christy Sullivan, and I'm the Secretary of the American Society for Cellular and Computational Toxicology. Welcome to today's webinar. It's presented uh, like every webinar in our series by AICCT and by the European Society for Toxicology in Metro. Both of our organizations host regular meetings and other activities like this webinar series to promote computational and in vitro toxicology fields and the scientists who work in them. And we also offer training and education and aim to support early career scientists in their endeavors. So first of all, for the webinar today, though it is recorded and the recording will be posted on the AICCT website a few days from now. So you can see the link at the bottom of your screen and you'll also receive an email with a link to the slides and uh, the webinar page itself. Also, your lines are muted. Uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions after the presentation using the question module. So if you look in the GoToMeeting control panel, GoToWebinar control panel, excuse me, there is a little question module and you can enter a question and then we'll save them all till, till um, Dr. Allen's finished speaking. You can also reach us in the chat box if you're having technical issues or anything like that. So I just wanted to mention that we have a fall meeting coming up in October. ASCCT has its meeting every fall. This year it's going to be a virtual meeting. Um, and I would encourage you to submit your abstracts. We're going to probably do, instead of a two full two-day meeting, we'll have um, sessions spread out over you know, three or four days to um, allow for hearing each other's research and um, trying to, we'll try to offer as well some online engagement opportunities, poster presentations, um, everything that you would look for in a meeting. So we have some great confirmed speakers and hopefully you will consider attending. So now I'm going to turn it over to Anna Maria Vingard, who is the board member of ESTIV and professor of toxicology at Technical University of Denmark. She's just going to give us some updates from the ESTIV side and introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, before I'm going to present today's speaker, I would like to make a few announcements. Um, as I'm a board member of ESTIV, um, we have some news for you. Uh, the annual meeting this year was has been postponed uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, but it has now been uh, arranged in 2022 in November in Barcelona. Um, and um, I hope that we'll meet many of you there. We'll uh, do our best to put together an exciting program. ESTIV is also arranging uh, training courses and um, the next training course in applied toxicology will be in October uh, this year. And you can go to our website to, um, to uh, dig into the details and uh, to, um, to see the program for the course. There are still um, a few seats available. Uh, it's a very uh, popular course. And then finally, uh, there'll be an electronic uh, general assembly of the ESTIV uh, this year and uh, it's now open for members who can go and uh, vote for um, whether they agree on the new members of the ESTIV board. We are going to extend the board with new members and um, uh, it's up to the, to the members of ESTIV to vote yes or no for that. Yes, and now to uh, today's uh, speaker, I would like to introduce Tim Allen, 
who was selected by the ESTE board as the recipient of the Early Career Award in 2020. And Tim was selected because of his outstanding and significant contribution to the field of animal-free toxicology. He is a research associate at the MRC Toxicology Unit at University of Cambridge and completed his PhD in 2016. Uh, and it dealt with molecular initiating events and how computational methods can be used to predict them. And since then, he has undertaken postdoctoral work in the Department of Chemistry in Cambridge and at the US EPA. In 2019, Tim moved to the MRC Toxicology Unit to continue his work in predictive toxicology, including new investigations into how we can use and understand state-of-the-art machine learning approaches. I'm very happy to, to give the word to Tim Allen, who is going to speak about the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence in toxicology and risk assessment. Please, Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna-Marie. That's a very uh, generous uh, introduction. I appreciate it very much. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to my talk this afternoon. It's great that you are, well, this afternoon in, in Europe, this, uh, this morning in the United States. It's great that you've been able to join us for, uh, for this talk, and I hope you really enjoy it, obviously. And I'm here today to talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches and how we are starting to use them in toxicology and risk assessment. So I've divided my talk today down into three sections. So I'd like to start uh, on some introductory areas, talking a little bit about what artificial intelligence is uh, and how machine learning algorithms work. And then I want to devote the majority of my time uh, after these kind of brief introductions uh, on talking about how we can use these uh, new technologies in the science of toxicology and where I think they are going next. So to kind of kick off, uh, I, I first made this slide um, about artificial intelligence when I gave a talk last year uh, in association with the Belgian Society of Toxicology um, at a, a three hours kind of event where we were talking about uh, I was asked to talk about artificial intelligence. So what I did is I went to a stock photos website and I typed in artificial intelligence and I downloaded several images that I thought kind of summarize some of the things that people think about when they think of the field. Uh, we have the, the top left, we have the kind of half human brain, half uh, circuit board brain thing. Uh, that theme is continued on the top right where we have the circuit board kind of cut out into a brain shape. Uh, in the bottom left, we have the lady's face with bits of computer parts uh, stamped onto it. Uh, and in the bottom right, we have the absolutely prototypical one, I think, that you see uh, in these kinds of talks where you have the human brain with, with the code uh, and the computer parts exploding out with a, uh, a variety of kind of colourful lights. Uh, and really, is this, is this what artificial intelligence is? Uh, and is this how it's really going to change uh, the way that we do science? Well, I think that artificial intelligence can actually be defined in a significantly more straightforward way than this. Uh, and a straightforward definition might be uh, that an artificial intelligence is a machine that's capable of doing things that humans consider to be intelligent. Uh, humans generally consider themselves to be intelligent, so if machines are able to mimic that behaviour, then they would also be considered intelligent. Uh, and this definition fits really well with Alan Turing's Turing test, which was essentially devised uh, about 60 or 70 years ago now. Um, and the idea of the Turing test is that you take a human evaluator who's shown at the bottom of the screen and you allow them to have conversations with two players, one of which is a computer uh, and one of which is a human. And if the evaluator, through the conversations that they have with the two players, can determine which is a computer and which is a human, then the computer would be considered to have passed the Turing test. Uh, so being able to have these kinds of conversations is definitely something that humans do that could be considered intelligent. Uh, but there are others, and I've listed some on this slide here, a uh, non-exhaustive list. Uh, humans can sense the world around them through vision and other senses. Uh, we can explore the world by moving through it. As we just saw, we can communicate through speech. 
Uh, and we can recognize patterns in objects. Uh, for example, if after this webinar you were to be hungry and you were to go to the kitchen, you might see a banana. And even if you'd only seen a banana a very few number of times in the past, if you like bananas, you'd pick the banana up and eat the banana because you know uh, that it is a banana. And this is kind of a remarkable uh, capacity for learning that humans have, that with relatively few examples, they're able to learn uh, quite a lot of things. But humans and computers are in, uh, sorry, yeah, humans and computers intrinsically are very are good at very different tasks. So um, on here, uh, in the top left, we have the tasks that computers are very good at, that humans aren't so good at. Things like lots of data storage or mass calculations. Uh, and in the bottom right hand side, humans are much better at tasks like long term planning, general problem solving uh, and empathy. Um, and this generally makes computers very good companions for scientists because they're able to do things that scientists are relatively bad at. Uh, and the scientists can deal with the general problem solving long term planning part of the scientific process. In the middle, along the diagonal, we're starting to see the tasks where machine learning is bringing computers a lot closer to where humans are in terms of complex movement, uh, language processing and vision. And as such, we can actually label some of our fields uh, of uh, artificial intelligence onto these different areas of uh, intelligence. So uh, feels like computer vision and robotics have come a long way recently. Natural language processing, uh, i.e. the way that computers can interpret speech, has come enormously far in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, if, if people remember what um, speech recognition algorithms and computers used to be like 10 or 15 years ago, they were absolutely rubbish um, and they'd never work properly, they'd never get you what you wanted. And now we consider it to be completely normal if you're allowed to go to your friend's house, you can go in and you'd see that they have an, a brand new Amazon Echo or, or Google Home thing. Uh, you'd be very, very happy to ask it what the weather's like or to uh, talk to it. Uh, and you'd be happy that it would understand you completely, even though it's never heard your voice before, because the learning that's been done through machine learning is, is so much more advanced now than it ever was before. But the part that we're going to be talking about mostly today is machine learning, and that is how uh, machines learn to recognize patterns in objects. So this would be a, a typical definition of machine learning. Uh, machine learning algorithms are computer programs that are able to learn from provided data and carry out specific tasks without explicit instructions from a human programmer. And this is kind of key. So uh, computers are obviously good at lots of things, but when we have to code computers up and we have to give them explicit instructions on how to do things, that's a major fallback for them. Um, human programmers, it's very, very difficult. If you imagine a task like coding a computer to play a game of tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses, uh, it, the, it would be very straightforward to give it a set of rules and if it followed those rules it would essentially never lose. But games like chess and Go uh, are far more complex and coding up those rules you might be able to build a machine that could beat someone who's not very good at those games, someone like me, I'm not a particularly good chess player, but you could never code a computer that would defeat uh, a grandmaster. Uh, machine learning has proved time and again recently that in games like chess and Go and even in real-time strategy games like uh, StarCraft 2 that they are able to learn by playing against themselves without having to be told about what the rules are by humans and then they can defeat uh, world expert humans at these games so uh, it certainly takes advantage of some of the things they're really good at but how do they do this how do machines go from being good at calculations to learning about data well uh, if you wanted to build a machine learning algorithm to do the kinds of things that i try and do in my day to day life uh, the first thing you'd have to do is gather some data. So this slide shows a uh, group of arbitrary chosen chemicals. Uh, if you're interested in, in toxicology, you're probably interested in a certain number of chemicals and the effects that they have. So you would go out and you'd gather as many chemicals as you can. The gathering data phase for computational science in general is very important. It's very important that we have reliable data to build models based on. It's very important that our data has been collected in a consistent manner, preferably. It would be wonderful if it, could, if it could all be collected by the same lab or by the same experimental scientists, but obviously this is uh, not really possible or not really feasible. We have to take the data as we can get it, but we want it to all have been performed with good GLP, for example, um, and reported in a consistent manner. So once we've got our data, we're going to want to find a way to put our compounds into our computer. And 
this is an area where computers do struggle because I, as a chemist, and I'm sure a lot of you could look at this molecule and say, we can recognize certain features that it has. We recognize that it has a basic nitrogen in the bottom right hand corner. It has a hydrogen bond donor in the top left hand side and an aromatic ring that could do some kind of price stacking with a biological target. Computers can't do this. They don't have the same intuition for looking at molecules and understanding what they are all about. So we can code these molecules to go into a computer using a chemical fingerprint, which is a relatively straightforward algorithm that takes the molecule, it takes each individual heavy atom, and it considers that heavy atom on its own, then it with its neighbors and it with its neighbors' neighbors to create a number of these fragments, essentially, with different diameters. And once it's broken your molecule down into all of these different pieces, it then gives a unique identifier to each one of those pieces, which can then subsequently be folded onto a bit string. So what you get out at the end of the fingerprinting procedure is a string of a fixed length, which is really important because computers need those fixed length strings to be able to do their calculations, where it has ones and zeros, where ones would be the presence of a chemical feature and zeros would be the absence of that feature. So once you've got your string, you can think about starting to build an algorithm. And what you would do is you take your input string, which we've just talked about, this particular input string shown here is at length 100. It's made of some ones and zeros. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to build a neural network that will link this input vector to an output vector. And the output represents the probability of that input being active at a specific MIE or molecular initiating event. So that's the kind of task that I'm interested in. <coughs> and on here, I've, I've listed some MIEs that you could potentially think about doing this for, uh, things like the androgen receptor, the Herg ion channel, uh, and the serotonin transporter. So if we put our neural network in the middle, the neural network will look something like this. The neural network is made of layers. Uh, and each of those layers are made of neurons, which are the circles that we see on the screen here. The input layer is where the input vector is directly inputted to. And then the different layers are linked to the ones before and the ones after by what we call synapses. So a synapse might look something like this, and it's a mathematical equation that links the top neuron in the input layer to the top neuron in the first hidden layer. Uh, where that neuron's value is multiplied by a weight, uh, weight one, and then added to a bias, bias one, and then put through a sigmoid function. And the sigmoid function is shown in the orange box. Uh, the idea of the sigmoid function is that we give nonlinearity to the model. So uh, the model can learn things that have nonlinear relationships. Uh, each of the individual connections, such as this one here, have their own unique weight and bias values which are the things that we can change in the training procedure in order to make the machine learn. So this first neuron in the input layer will be connected to all of the neurons in the first hidden layer, as all of the neurons in the first input layer will be connected to all of the inputs of all of the um, neurons in the first hidden layer, and then so on and so forth, they propagate left to right into the second hidden layer and then into the output layer. And what we've ended up with here is we've ended up going from our input of 100 numbers through a function with 1,230 parameters to a vector which represents the probability of the input referring to a specific molecular initiating event. In this particular case, the, the network thinks that the serotonin transporter is the most likely MIE for this particular molecule. So now that we've set our network up, we need to do the training part. And the machine learning procedure is essentially using the training data to choose those 1,230 parameters to match the experimental outputs that we gathered at the start to the molecules that they are correct for, at least as much as possible, given the number of training examples, etc. And to do that, we need to use something called the cost function. So imagine for this molecule, we have our correct uh, experimental output which shows that the molecule should only be considered active at the mu opioid receptor. So the cost function is essentially the correct or experimental output minus the output that's given by the neural network, uh, and that gives us a cost uh, vector, which uses each of those values squared to ensure that they all sum properly. And the cost function can essentially be considered as a surface. So if we had a slightly simpler model where we only had one weight and uh, one weight for input to layer one and one weight for layer one to the output, 
uh, we can write uh, mathematical equations based on what we saw earlier for the values of A1 and A2 uh, using their own weights and biases. Those can be combined into an equation that gives the output by just putting those two equations together. Uh, and what this means is that the cost function essentially is a surface. So uh, this is the kind of take home message. The cost function across different values of W1 and W2, it creates a surface. And what we want to do is we want to minimize the cost function. So we want to go downhill. Uh, so we'll do what was called gradient descent. We'll find out which direction is down and we'll push all of our weight and bias values in that direction to move towards the minimum. And the idea is that the global minimum of this surface will be the best trained network that we can create. So through a process that's known as back propagation, uh, if you watch closely, uh, the different weight and bias values throughout the network are adjusted and they're adjusted again. And our output from our neural network gets closer and closer to the correct or experimental output and the cost function is decreased. And that's how the training is done. Uh, at the end, after you've done the training, you would typically then put more molecules in and test those see what the network says about those molecules uh, and then that would give you statistical performance measures how good is it the neural networks aren't the only uh, class of machine learning algorithms there are of course others uh, on the left hand side here it shows a, a cartoon of a random forest so a random forest is another type of machine learning algorithm where different mathematical relations are generated using uh, slight parts of randomness based on the input data and then at the end, when you put new molecules in, they would each vote on whether they think that molecule is active or inactive, for example, and then the consensus of that vote would be the prediction. Uh, and you could also consider using something like a k-nearest neighbor algorithm, where you plot all of your training examples onto um, a reduced dimensionality space or a surface. And when you put your new molecule on that space, you say in this particular case, the blue star is closest to the dark blue circle. So maybe this is the class that it belongs to. If you were to look at the, the three nearest, you'd use that uh, blue circle that's drawn there. And you'd say, OK, it's actually two thirds closest to the dark blue circles and one third closest to the teal circles. Um, and all of the algorithms, they kind of essentially work in a similar way using training data to do training and then they're evaluated on test data. If people are interested in machine learning, uh, I would recommend checking out the machine learning crash course uh, by Google developers, which was developed by Dee Scully. Uh, this is a really great uh, kind of introduction to machine learning. It's how I initially learned how to do machine learning. Uh, it's really available and it has loads of great tutorials, videos and um, little exercises that run inside your browser. There's no need to download anything, uh, any software to, to run these things. Uh, and it gives you a really good uh, basis to use Google's TensorFlow, which is an algorithm that does the back propagation part of neural network development, which is kind of the most computationally complex part of it. So it would give you the expertise that was required to at least get started in machine learning. Um, yeah, I, overall, I think it's really great. So I'd recommend you check that out and hopefully you'd recognize some of the things that I've just been talking about. So. <laughs> How can we use this technology, this uh, AI or this machine learning in toxicology? Well, as has already been alluded to uh, earlier, I am interested in the molecular initiating event, which is part of the adverse outcome pathway. So the adverse outcome pathway is now 10 years old. Happy birthday. Uh, and uh, it was developed by Gary Ankley and his team at the US EPA. Uh, but as a chemist and as a computationist, I'm particularly interested in this part of the adverse outcome pathway where we're talking about how we can go from toxic and chemical properties to molecular initiating events things like dna binding or receptor ligand interaction or enzyme inhibition the reason that we've selected this as an appropriate task for computational modeling is that historically when computational approaches have been used to try to predict uh, organism responses things like lethality or uh, ld50s uh, or organ level responses you're skipping over a lot of very complicated biology and actually you can understand more mechanistically by making small jumps jumping from the chemical properties to the mie maybe from the mie to a certain uh, in vitro assay which comes at the cellular level up to the organs etc etc it's a more mechanistic toxicology way of thinking about things 
So obviously working in toxicology, we want to build models and, and uh, tools that can make predictions across as much biological space as possible. So this is a target list that I've been working with uh, up to recently. This is 79 different biological targets that we've been building our models for that I'll present results on today. Uh, we've recently extended this list up to 213 targets, I think, so uh, all of that stuff should be coming soon. The idea generally being that we know that our tools will be more useful if we can make predictions at more biological targets. So we've built models for these targets uh, using three approaches. Uh, neural networks, which I've already talked about, where we take chemical fingerprints as inputs and we predict biological activity uh, in a binary sense as an output, so active or inactive. Uh, random forest models, which have used physicochemical descriptors as inputs. So the idea here is rather than making a fingerprint of ones and zeros for your molecule, you calculate things like the number of heavy atoms, the molecular weight, the log P, etc., for your molecule, and then those become the input numbers for your, for your algorithm. And last but not least, we'll be comparing those approaches to structural alerts, which are a little bit more of a straightforward or old school approach to computational toxicology, where we've used a maximal common substructure to look at the training data and extract fragments of molecules that it thinks are associated with activity at the MIEs. Uh, what then happens is that a Bayesian statistics method is used to pick which substructures work the best and then iteratively prove their performance. Uh, the reason that this approach is quite popular is that unlike the machine learning approaches or the ones that maybe are considered more like machine learning, I'm still not 100% sure whether this is machine learning or not, um, they are considered to be more like a black box. Uh, you put the molecule in, you get a prediction out, the workings internally are very complex and very difficult to understand. Here, if you were a toxicologist and you were to run your molecule against the structural alerts, you could find the structure that your molecule hits, you could look at it and see the, the reason why the algorithm has made the prediction. You could then go to the training data or to other data sources and find other molecules that also contain that fragment. It's a very transparent process and therefore it's uh, very popular in terms of understanding. So how do these different approaches compare to one another? Well, I have some model performance statistics over the next few slides. Here we have the different methods, structural alerts, random forests, and neural networks, top to bottom, uh, with increasing model complexity going down the screen. Uh, the statistical performance is shown as sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, and uh, MCC, which is Matthew's correlation coefficient. And the columns to focus on are accuracy, which is essentially the percentage of predictions that we get right, and MCC, which is a score from negative one to positive one, where the higher scores indicate better models. And it takes into account data imbalance. It should be, um, uh, should be reasonable to say that if you had a data set which had 99% active chemicals in it, if you made a model that predicted every molecule to be active, you could get them right 99% of the time. But that doesn't make it a good model. So we take into account uh, data balance using uh, the MCC value. And generally, as we go down this table, uh, we see an increase in performance going from structural alerts to random forests and from random forests to neural networks. And this is confirmed when we look at the predictions individually by target. So I'll, I'll skip through the next few slides relatively quickly, but basically this table shows the performance of the neural network and then a comparison between that performance and how the structural alert or the random forest performed in the same prediction task. Uh, and it's blue where the neural network is better and it's orange where the structural alert or the random forest is better. So. Uh, hopefully you'll see as I kind of flip through these various parts, generally uh, we get a sea of blue and most of the points are blue. Sometimes we get targets that haven't worked so well with the neural network, but mostly it's blue. And actually across, uh, I think 650 comparisons that were made in this table, 73% uh, of the time the neural network is performing better than the other approaches, which is really great if you love neural networks. So it's, it's performing slightly better, which is perhaps expected for the slightly more sophisticated modeling approach. Based on what I said earlier about data, you might think that uh, the number of molecules is very, very high for these approaches to work. But actually, we tended to find that we didn't always need a huge number of data points to produce models that looked good. Uh, and in fact, this graph, which shows the statistical performance on the y-axis and the number of chemical compounds in the data set on the x-axis, 
show that once we kind of get past a thousand chemicals, which we kind of found was the cutoff for the neural networks to do their thing, we have a relatively high level of performance going across. And actually it's two specific targets, the HERG ion channel and MAPK1, uh, which are specifically very challenging to model. And we found those targets to be very challenging to model, not only in the sense of the neural network, but also in the structural alerts and the random forests too. And we found that was specifically because uh, they have quite low modelability indexes, which is shown here on the x-axis. So you'll notice that they're quite a long way down. Uh, and generally, as the data sets become more modelable, they uh, perform better statistically. Uh, the modelability index, essentially, it talks about how many activity cliffs are, how changing small parts of the molecule uh, leads to big changes in the uh, activity change. And the reason this is challenging for computers is because they're looking for general patterns in the data. Uh, and when small changes are made, they don't necessarily expect there to be a big change uh, in biological activity. So the neural networks are more complex predictors than the structural alerts, but they do have some advantages of their own that we can kind of delve into to try to understand their predictions a little better and gain some confidence. The first one is the idea of this positive probability value. So the neural network has two output nodes for each biological target, one of which is how much it thinks that the molecule is active, and the other one is how much it thinks that the molecule is inactive. And by balancing the values that you get in these two nodes, you can essentially get a positive probability where if, for example, uh, you had a value of 0 0.05, you'd be pretty confident that this molecule was going to be experimentally negative. It's down there at the bottom of this graph in a category where only 2.45% of the molecules are experimentally positives in the test data. Whereas if the value was nearer to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, you'd be less sure and that would allow you to go away and maybe do some more calculations or conduct uh, experimental in vitro approaches to decide uh, whether or not you think that molecule is active. This uh, idea of using the positive probability also gives you the option to change your model threshold. So if uh, you were particularly interested uh, in passing compounds through a screening procedure, I would point you to the, the table at the bottom with the 0 0.1. So if we change the model threshold to 0 0.1, uh, by default, when the model makes its predictions, above 0 0.5 is active, below 0 0.5 is inactive. If we change that threshold to 0 0.1, therefore above 0 0.1, everything is considered active and below it's inactive, uh, we get a very low negative predictive value or NPV. And that's shown here as 95.2%. And what that means is that 95% of the time when the model is predicting something to be negative, it is actually experimentally negative. And the reason that that's good for screening is that you want to be able to push chemicals forward through, through the pipeline of development, but you don't want to push positives forward. You don't want um, false negatives. They're the, they're the worst ones, right? So we can change the threshold to 0 0.1, reducing uh, the number of false negatives, the predictions that are uh, algorithm makes. One other thing that we've been thinking about in how to decode or demystify the internal workings of the neural network is called the network similarity or the neural network activation similarity. Uh, and I'll just explain that here. So when I was talking about the neural networks, um, the neurons which are represented on this diagram as the circles, they're actually just placeholders for numbers. So when you put a molecule in, the signal propagates left to right across the network and each of those uh, neurons becomes uh, filled with a numerical value. Theoretically, we can extract those values from those different neurons and generate a vector or a string which describes how the neural network is thinking about your input molecule. We can compare that vector to vectors for molecules from the training set, for example, to try to find out which molecules are the most similar. Uh, and because the input of the neural network is chemistry and its output is biological, we should consider this perhaps as a mixture of chemical and biological similarity for these molecules. Uh, in a cartoon sense, uh, we could take this particular test chemical with its pattern highlighted in, in orange and hopefully you'll agree that if you look at these two patterns this pattern is a little bit more similar to what I've shown for training chemical A than for training chemical B and therefore you'd say that chemical A has a relatively high network similarity to the test chemical whereas training chemical B has a relatively low network similarity. 
So we did this calculation for a, a few examples. We took some drug molecules that were not in our training data. And we calculated this neural network activation similarity um, and compared those molecules to the training sets. And on here, I plotted that on the x-axis against Tanamoto similarity on the y-axis. And Tanamoto similarity is string similarity uh, for chemical structures. It's designed to bring chemical structures out that have uh, similar input fingerprints. So that measures the similarity between the inputs to the neural networks. And the good thing about this diagram is that uh, the points do not align on x equals y, which would have suggested that the network was not learning new things about the molecules and their fingerprints, it was just regurgitating information based on those fingerprints. So that certainly suggests there's something there. It also tells us that while a higher value of Tanimoto similarity generally means a higher network similarity, it does not, it's not required, it's not necessary to have high Tanimoto similarity to have high network activation similarity. Uh, the last lesson that I learned from plotting this graph is don't try to use Excel to plot a graph with 30,000 data points on it because it does crash all the time. But I think that the best way to kind of explore this is to show it through a case study. So let's imagine taking this molecule. This molecule is amiodarone. It's been well studied in the past uh, and it's active at the Herg ion channel. Uh, we put it through the neural network and the neural network gave us a predictive uh, positive probability of 90.1%. So the network was quite, po well, quite um, positive that this molecule was going to be active, which is, is good because it is experimentally active. We can then find the five most similar chemicals by neural network activation similarity within the training data and the five most similar by Tanimoto, which is shown as F to J here. So the first thing I noted about these chemicals when I first looked at them is that the one that has the most structural similarity to amiodarone and the one that as a chemist I would consider to be the most similar would be this one here, chemical F, which seems to share many of the backbone features of amiodarone with the exception of missing the two iodines on the central aromatic ring. But despite this, it actually has quite a, a relatively low Tanimoto similarity of 0 0.275, which perhaps means that it's not entirely suitable for uh, something like a read across, especially not in a one-to-one -one case. Uh, when we look at the top five cases for each of our similarity values, we actually find that while three of the highest Tanimoto similarity chemicals match the experimental activity of amiodarone, it's actually four out of five for the neural network similar chemicals. And as you extend this out to 10 examples, 20 examples and 50 examples, this comes up more and more in favor of, of the network activation similarity. Uh, and last but not least, uh, amiodarone is a compound that I've studied in the past. And I found, well, when I was searching through the literature, that the, one of the hypotheses for why it is active at the Herg channel is the basic nitrogen atom attached to the aromatic ring. And it's definitely encouraging to see that the neural network is picking out compounds that also have that structural feature. Whereas among the Tanimoto most similar compounds, those uh, features are not quite so prevalent. So hopefully that will, will help to help us understand a little bit more about the, how the network is thinking and maybe increase some confidence in its predictions. I think a really good way going forward to try and make use of all the predictions that we have is not necessarily to view them in competition with one another, but to view them working together. So let's take the strengths of our different approaches, use them together to make predictions and therefore gain confidence by doing that. So if we look at our three different modeling approaches we've got the transparent prediction al prediction algorithm of the structural alerts we've got the high quality predictions of the neural network and we've got the use of the physicochemical descriptors in the random forests so if we use them all together we should be able to get a consensus approach where we have increased confidence in our predictions so did this work uh, well i applied it in a number of cases using two different combination uh, methods. The first was to use a majority vote, where you basically just take the votes from each of the methods, say whoever got the most votes wins. Uh, and in this one, we see a slight increase in statistical performance when we go from either the structural alerts, random forests or neural networks on their own to the combined method at the top. But the place where you can gain a lot of uh, confidence is actually when all of the methods agree with one another. So that's what the unanimous method is. The idea here is if a molecule is predicted as uh, active in all of the algorithms or inactive in all of the algorithms, then you would put it into that category. Otherwise, it would be called unassigned. 
So in this case, we had about 10% of our training data, of our test data, sorry, ending up as unassigned, but the increase in performance on the chemicals where we did have that confidence was much, much higher, nearly hitting 95% total accuracy, which is really, um, really encouraging. But at the end of the day, these are still algorithms that are making binary predictions. They're still making predictions of active or not active at biological targets. Uh, when I gave uh, the aforementioned talk last year, I was asked uh, by an audience member, these uh, hazard identification methods could be very useful, but they're not risk assessment. And risk assessment requires quantitative understanding. So since then, uh, I went back to the drawing board uh, and I realized that quantitative predictions would be great for the algorithms to make. Um, so I took the androgen receptor data set and I scrubbed it to include only quantitative activity values and I ended up with nearly 5,000 values for that target. I had to change my loss function uh, to mean squared error and I ended up with a neural network with a single output node. So it had one output node with a linear activation function, which was really good for predicting these P activity values, which are kind of between zero and 10. The models are evaluated almost always using uh, root mean squared error. So that tells you how far away um, the predictions are on average from the experimental values. And if you plot the test data uh, on a graph, it's shown here. So we have experimental activity shown uh, on the y-axis and predicted activity shown here on the x-axis. And generally, I think they actually line up pretty well, uh, kind of starting to cluster around that x equals y diagonal. The root mean squared error across all the predictions uh, is around uh, 0 0.1, uh, sorry, around 1, just less than 1, 0 0.95. Um, and that, I think, is really impressive, especially considering how difficult this prediction task is due to the discrepancy in the data. So if we look at the data breakdown, each of these colored blocks here essentially represents 10% uh, of that test set. And what you'll hopefully notice is that between the experimental activity values of around four and five and a half, that's about 50% of the experimental data. So loads of the experimental compounds are kind of four to five and a half which makes the RMSE in that area easier for the uh, network to reduce. So that's getting 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Whereas outside of that space, especially moving up towards the experimental activities of eight, nine, and 10, we're seeing a much higher error or RMSE 2.2. Uh, and that's unsurprising because it's very difficult to convince the network to make predictions at the eight or nine value uh, because it thinks so many of the molecules are four or five. So I'm continuing with this methodology and trying to apply it to more targets. I think with uh, predictive values uh, with errors of around one log unit definitely has some merit uh, to be used. And in conclusion, uh, we have used a structural alert method, the random forests and the neural networks uh, to provide high quality predictions of binary activity at human MIEs in the time of a hazard assessment kind of way. I think that the key to getting these methods used more is increased understandings of how they work, uh, increased understandings of why they make certain predictions, perhaps using things like the network similarity uh, and the combination of those models. So using them together to gain extra confidence to help them be used more in toxicology decision making. And quantitative predictions, which is what we're moving towards, hopefully they'll help to push this methodology closer to risk assessment rather than just hazard identification, uh, so that these algorithms can be more useful in the future across more decisions that need to be made. So that's uh, basically all I have to say uh, today. Um, it leaves me to thank Professors Jonathan Goodman and Anne Wiss, who are my bosses in Cambridge, Unilever, who fund uh, the research that I do, uh, and Dr. Paul Russell and Dr. Steve Goodsell and all their colleagues at SEAC, the Safety and Environmental Assurance Centre at Unilever, uh, who now use some of our models in decision making, specifically the structural alerts. And we're currently working on building um, as essentially an interface to bring in uh, the neural networks and the random forests too, to try and make them as useful as possible for those guys. Uh, Dr. Andy Wedlake, who was a PhD student and has graduated now, he worked heavily on the uh, structural alert methods. 
Maria Folia and Dr. Sam Petrota, who are who are slash were Unilever staff, and they worked on the Random Forests. Alexander Howarth, who's a PhD student in the Goodman Group in Cambridge, who provided uh, some of the slides uh, and the inspiration for uh, the How Machines Work bit. Uh, the Centre for Molecular Informatics and the MRC Toxicology Unit, which is the places that I work at when I don't have to stay at home all the time. Uh, St John's College for their continued support. I'd like to thank uh, SDIV and uh, ASCCT for the opportunity to talk to you. I think uh, given the current uh, COVID-19 crisis, it's really great that we can still kind of get together and talk about science uh, online. So thank you so much for the opportunity and everyone who's been on uh, for your kind attention. Thank you so much. I'm happy to attempt to ask, answer any questions, to ask questions, to answer any questions that you have uh, about anything that I've talked about today or any other questions that you just want to ask. There you go. Great. Well, um, you can ask a question if you like, but we I do have some <laughs> questions. Uh, just a reminder uh, to the attendees, if you want to ask a question, just type it into the question module and we will try to get to them. Um, okay, so the first one it came in fairly sort of in the middle of the talk, so maybe think back to that. Is it correctly understood that you use endpoints as different output nodes and thus train a network for predicting several endpoints with one neural network model? So you can kind of do it as, as you please. Um, there are certainly advantages. So the, the one that I showed and that idea of predicting several endpoints through one network is called multitask learning. Uh, and the idea here would be that you don't have to do so many training scenarios because if you have a hundred things you want to predict, you can put one neural network, you can do training once, and then you'll end up with something that can make predictions. The disadvantage here is that you have to find a way to get around incomplete data sets where your data sets have, for example, some molecules that have been tested in HERG, some have been tested in serotonin transporter, and they haven't been tested in each other. So uh, in general, that approach could work, but most of the things that I've built have been single task predictors just to overcome that problem with data. It's a little bit more intensive in the training procedure um, and you end up with lots of different models that you run to get your overall output for your 79 targets. But it does uh, avoid uh, certain issues with incomplete data matrices as such. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and there certainly are a lot of people who do build the multitask learners as well. So. Uh, they do they do certainly exist within toxicology so the next one is for this neural network model how do you address overfitting issues okay uh, so when i talked about how machines learn i didn't talk about overfitting um, overfitting is essentially the idea that uh, you have a training set and if you let the network continually train itself for many, many iterations, it will learn how to predict the training set incredibly well. But it's learning all of the intricacies and um, little quirks of the training set, but they're, they're not, they don't exist in the test set. They don't exist in the real world. So what you end up with is a model that looks like it's going to be really good, and then it's not very good. Uh, and generally, uh, the way that you can overcome this in uh, neural networks, I use something that's called L2 regularization. Uh, it's a, a mathematical method that alters your cost function and takes into account uh, the value of your weights and biases so that the network is discouraged from learning too much on one specific path from left to right as you go across it. You also tend to try to use early stopping. So rather than allowing the network to run and run and run, where there's a divergence between the performance you get on the training set and the test set, you stop it before that happens. Uh, and we do that too. And obviously at the end, when you evaluate your performance on the training set and the test set, you try to keep the statistical performance across those two sets as close as possible. Okay, so you try to make sure that there's not gonna be a large, there's always gonna be some discrepancy between how good you do on the training data and how well you do on the test data, but you try to keep that to a manageable minimum. So that's, that's kind of how we've been trying to do that. Um, kind of a neat question. It, uh, someone's wondering how they can do a PhD on this topic. Uh, that's a really good question. So um, there are several groups that I know of that publish kind of in this area. 
uh, you could kind of go down, you've got a couple of choices. So you could kind of go down the machine learning path, especially if you're really interested in the mathematics. You could look for groups in computer science departments and you could talk to professors there about applying those methodologies in toxicology um, or maybe drug discovery. And I'm sure you'd get a lot of interest in that space. Or you could approach it from the other side. You could say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go to a center where people are doing experimental toxicology and I'm gonna talk to them about how uh, we could maybe apply some of these approaches or other computational algorithms to kind of enhance their research. So it kind of depends on how you want to come at it. Um, I think overall, the resources that are available online and a lot of university courses now are becoming more and more towards things like programming and machine learning. So it's definitely, you're definitely capable of learning it without necessarily going to a group that just does this science because there aren't a lot of those. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of potential to to work to learn yourself or to learn in, in collaboration with with the university's courses, for example, at certain at certain schools, um, to do the machine learning and then to work with a, a maybe a group which is slightly more in, in the experimental space. Great advice, thank you. Um, one question about in one of the one of the last slides. Um, they are wondering about the activity values, the numbers between three and 10. Are these effect sizes or potencies? So these are what I call P activity values. So it's minus the log of the activity value that's given in uh, the database Kemble, which is uh, an IT50 or a KI or a KD generally. Um, so that's how you would convert those values back into the ones that you're used to, the kind of nanomolar potency, etc. Um, the reason that we do that procedure and we use that negative log is because it puts the points uh, in a manageable area and makes them more predictable for, for machine learning, but also for kind of QSARs and, and other mathematical methods. Um, it's very challenging for computers to deal with those numbers that kind of go all the way to the nano or picomolar at one end. Um, so we use the minus uh, log to get, kind of get rid of that. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions about, I and mean, I think the case studies you were kind of showing the prediction of already known chemicals, and you're sort of building the network with existing data. And so, mm -hmm. how? And obviously, the the purpose is to predict unknown chemicals. So, can you say a little bit about like, what needs to be done to make sure those are the model can do that? Uh, yeah, another another huge problem. Obviously, when we gather training data at the whole start of the procedure, we want to get data which is as wide reaching as possible. One of the biggest problems and the most difficult things to overcome is the fact that there's this uh, enormous pressure on scientists to publish positive results that uh, they need to publish binders. People don't like to publish not binders. Mm -hmm. And the way we've tried to overcome that issue of having loads of positive chemicals and hardly any negative experimental data points is we've combined the Kemble uh, database, which is lots of drug molecules, lots of actives from the literature, with the ToxCast EPA data, which is a wide variety of chemicals across various different types of uses. Uh, but that, because those chemicals were not selected to be uh, positive, um, they have the advantage uh, of being a lot more negative. So just using one of those data sets at a time, you'll get a very imbalanced data set, but by combining them, we've managed to create data sets that are a lot more um, balanced, which makes the prediction task more useful. Obviously, you have to be very careful when applying these algorithms to brand new chemicals that are distinctly chemically different from your training data. Uh, and this is something that uh, generally would be addressed with an applicability domain. So you would consider the similarity between the training set uh, and your new molecule to see if it is appropriate. Uh, if your training data is all drugs and then your new molecule is uh, a pesticide, that's gonna be really difficult to make predictions on. So you have to take that into account when you're making predictions. And yeah, it's kind of one of those things that we've, we've we're starting to look into as well and kind of making the algorithms more useful. Great. Um, a couple of questions about public public availability and transparency and, and simplicity, I guess, because, um, you know, so one questioner is wondering about, well, yes, these models have better performance maybe than structural alerts, but structural alerts are a little more straightforward. So is that better from that perspective and, and, you know, sort of in 
um, but, in regular yeah, use, I mean, you, you regulators will want to see, um, you know, more tra uh, transparency in the, in the use of the models and the predictions. They absolutely will. Um, and so do toxicologists who are trying to apply the models at Unilever, they want to ask questions about how the models make predictions. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take case studies. It's going to take collaborations between model constructors and people who use the models. It's very, it's all fine for me to start telling people, oh, I can tell you this, I can tell you this, I can tell you this. But when you kind of get that feedback from the uh, industrial side of saying, this is the kind of information that we want to see, and this is how it helps us to make a decision or to reach uh, an endpoint for our, for our, uh, the choices that we're making in, for example, screening. Uh, that's a lot more useful uh, and we've pushed a lot recently on on the, with the neural networks on trying to trying to make them a little bit less uh black boxy i guess uh, and ultimately yeah the structural alerts they are great because of their transparency um but regulatorily everything that's computational is still kind of behind so it's about trying to use all of the approaches and about trying to build a a, a, a piece of evidence that says you know, this algorithm works, this algorithm works, this algorithm works, here's the data um, that we have. Uh, and then hopefully over time, there'll be a shift towards more computational approaches of all types, uh, be that read across, be that QSAR, be that machine learning or structural alerts. Great, thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'm just trying to sort through some of them to see um, what we can get to. Um, but thanks everyone for all your questions. Um, here's one. How do you divide the data into training data and test data? What, what criteria do you typically use? So um, one of the ways in which this can be done is it can be done randomly. So you can, it's very straightforward. You just randomly assign 25% of your data, 20% of it. I use 25%. Some people use 20% uh, into the uh, test and then 75% becomes the training. That's kind of about the, the right uh, balance of training and test. Um, but a way that we've, we've started to use more recently, which we think is a little bit more rigorous and, and doesn't overestimate the performance of the models quite so much, is to cluster the data first. So you cluster the data based on the chemicals that are in it. You create, let's say, five clusters. One of those clusters becomes the test set and then you use the other four perhaps for training. Uh, another thing that you tend to do is you tend to use about four fifths of the data that you're using for training. You use some of it for the, the true training and some of it for the validation, which is where you choose the hyperparameters. Let's say you choose how many nodes you want, how many layers you want. Uh, so you use that 80% uh, of the data to do all that. And then at the end, once you've chosen your best model, you then go back to the other cluster. Uh, and you say these chemicals, they might not be enormously different from the training data, but they have been pushed out for a reason. So they are at least a little bit different. Uh, and then the most stringent way to do that would be by going through cross-validation cross where you would use each of those five clusters once as the held out, the entirely held out test set, uh, which adds to the number of cycles that you have to do, which obviously makes it more computationally um, challenging and makes it take more time. But I think it gives you the most rigorous way to uh, evaluate your models, uh, which I think is really good. So that's kind of what we've been moving towards doing. Great. Um, maybe the last last question today, could this network be used to address the applicability domain compliance of a molecule? And I think this comes up both in computational, but also more and more in, in, in um, in vitro models or com combinations of models. So. For example, you're comparing the structural properties of a molecule with those of the, the data set to, to assess similarity. Yeah, um, I think that there is potential there. I think that the, 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 so everything that I've talked about with neural networks has been what we would call supervised learning. So what it's doing is it's learning to link the input with the output or the feature with the given label. Perhaps you could take the inputs for the chemicals and rather than giving it labels, you could ask it to uh, build clusters which is called unsupervised learning of molecules that have similarity, et cetera. Then what you could do is you could see how your new molecule, when it fits into that procedure, whether it fits with your existing chemicals or not with them. So that's potentially uh, an example of how that could perhaps work. I think as well, generally with applicability domains, you need to find 
you can use fingerprints, you could use descriptors, or you could use something else. You need to find ways of describing chemicals to see if your new chemical is close to or far away from um, your existing data set. The one thing that kind of really challenges this area, I think, is the notion of similarity and the idea that no one is really, uh, no one really agrees on whether something is similar or not similar. You have to really yeah. Uh, delve into the details to, to really get to that point where you can say, okay, we're all agreed, this is similar. That never happens. Um, and until we kind of do it more, I think, that might never be, that might never be satisfied. Yeah, I, I agree. That's sort of, you can use the tool, but then how it's, how the results are used is the, is the main question, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, that brings us to the end of the hour, and I really appreciate um, your presentation. Um, thank you so much for, for talking with us, and um, thanks everyone for listening, and I will say goodbye and have a, have a great day. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay yes. safe. Bye. Bye.